Welcome to A Flash of Beauty, the podcast, an audio experience dedicated to the further exploration of Bigfoot and the people Bigfoot has revealed itself to. What started as a documentary of personal narrative encounter stories and expert testimony has now shifted into a deeper inquiry into the forever changed lives of those that have witnessed firsthand this hidden truth. My name is Tobe Johnson co-producer of Flash of Beauty Bigfoot Revealed. Join me along with the crew and creators of this doc, director Brett Eichenberger, producer Jill Rimmon Snyder, and cinematographer Michael Ferry, as we go back into the trees to sit down once again with each guest in search of the truth, no matter how strange. Jill, Brett, hello again. Hello. How's it going? Hi. We just had a long weekend. I'm still recouping uh, from our long weekend. We had our our second annual Fork Sasquatch Days, where we did a, a little um, premiere of um, the sequel. The audience that uh, the ticket audience that showed up for two nights was privy to this doc. And I just remember I went to both premieres. I sat in the back row. I kind of like to stretch my legs once in a while after manning the board with Nancy Fry for uh, two days. And I remember standing in the back and hearing audible gasp. And um, and Brett, you mentioned as such too. Um, I let's just talk quickly about that experience there because no one's really spilled the beans about plot lines or anything on mm -hmm. online yet. But go ahead. Well, okay. So first and foremost, I, I want to let people know that they were, it was a screening of a work in progress. So we will be having our official world premiere uh, later on this summer, and we will keep you posted on the podcast as to when and where that is going to occur, but you do not do not want to miss it. The folks that were able to to come up and see the sneak preview of the work in progress and Forks saw something that was about 85 to 90 percent finished and um you're right tobe i mean i sat there i one of the things i love to do is i love to gauge the audience while we do screenings and um i heard multiple gasps in whispers and believe me you kids we've packed <laughs> a lot a lot of amazing stuff in this film and um, we're packing more and we're packing more we're putting a little bit more in and this is you know, dare I say it, we may have packed too much for one viewing. Um, and that's okay. That's by design. <laughs> There's a lot here to wrap your brain around. There was a lot for us to wrap our brains around when we were filming it, meeting these incredible people that had mm -hmm. these eyewitness accounts. So hmm. all I can say is get ready, strap on your paranormal seatbelt. It's going to be a wild ride. <laughs> wow. There's a tagline. Jill, what do you have to say? Oh boy. Um, Jill's at a loss of words for the first time ever. Right. No, I, I thought you were going to take that catchphrase in a different direction, but um, <laughs> I was like, no, no, not the documentary. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a great response. And what was really interesting for me is uh, before the screenings and the conversations with people, uh, they were kind of there were there were people who were a little bit standoffish about about their beliefs and what they thought Bigfoot is, you know, as far as a flesh and blood creature, could it be anything more? But I'll tell you, after both those screenings, I talked to so many people who were like, you know, you might be onto something, or you know, maybe mm -hmm. it's not so far fetched. Mm -hmm. So, so whereas uh, a flash of beauty, Bigfoot revealed was kind of like a Bigfoot 101 for people who are not part of the Bigfoot community or researchers or investigators, you know, that's the movie that got people uh, just on the page that Bigfoot is real and could exist. And this one, we take your hand and then we jump down the rabbit hole with you and take you along for a beautiful experience. Yeah, a crazy wild ride, strap yourself in style. Yeah. Um, 
real quick here, I did want to mention, you know, one of the things here, and I'll tell you who our guest here is in a second. Of course, you can read it in the byline. But one of the things that happens at these conferences is it automatically separates into two groups. And we generally play well with others, although there was two campfires, one for flesh and blood at Airbnb, one for us. <laughs> and we've grown used to it. They've grown used to it. Like I said, we play nice. But um, sometimes, um, you know, people just can't handle the weirder stuff and they don't want to necessarily see the weirder stuff. But I want to tell both of you that even though that's the case, afterwards, I started getting private messages from said group. And, um, you know, they were saying complimentary things, not only about the conference, but I, they weren't necessarily saying anything about the film, but I think they were reaching out where they hadn't before reached out because, because they want me to give them a hand out. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like this movie potentially could heal some old battle wounds of like being nasty to one another. And I didn't expect that. You know what I mean? Like I was approached at the conference, like, you know, why am I no longer your friend on Facebook and those kind of things? And I was like, well, this is kind of cool. I don't know. What are we mending fences? So there's a, we even had a debate between the flesh and blood and the woo there. And that thing could have totally gone pear shaped and it didn't. Everyone kind of acquiesced. Maybe it was the pressure of being on stage in front of an audience. I don't know. But the things that were said on stage, um, I thought were kind of shocking. And so I think there might be some bridging of some gaps going on here um, because now feels like the time. Am I, am I reaching too far, Brett and Jill? Not at all. No, okay. I, I picked up on that big time. I think that there's beginning to, to, we're getting a mutual respect amongst both sectors, if you will. And mm -hmm. I think that, that both, both of us realize or both groups realize that there is a science behind this. And that's the whole point is that mm -hmm. there's a science behind this. Number one, number two, the data doesn't lie and you can't skew the data and you can't toss the data out. And the data is that people are having these experiences along with the Bigfoot sightings. And you can't just conveniently throw that out because you have a theory. We're all looking for the truth, every single one of us. Um, I think if there's anybody out there that calls himself a researcher that's not looking for the truth, then they are solely in it for the financial gain. Um, Those are people who are just so invested in their narrative that they can't, uh, you know, by deviating, it would be a branding issue or just, it would be like admitting defeat. Don't you think? hundred percent. I, I think, you know, we all need to come together for the truth, for this, for the good of mankind, you know, uh, because there's so much to be gained from learning this knowledge and, like what we're going to talk to Ron Moorhead about is, you know, really some of this knowledge could prove an afterlife. It could prove the fact that we dwell in, in different dimensions when our soul leaves our body, because as Einstein said, you cannot destroy energy. And Ron talks about that very eloquently. So, you know, I think that, you know, if, if we can be kind and courteous and, um, open-minded with each other, one another, and listen to each other's theories, I think we can make some huge headway. And that's really the whole idea behind this, this new documentary. It's, it's us coming together saying, look, take these, take these stories from these people that are truthful and earnest in their depictions of these events, and let's talk about them, you know? Um, I'm, I, I will be the first to say that I'm not opposed to anybody, anybody debunking something or coming up with another solution for something that doesn't shut down the whole paranormal narrative by any stretch of the imagination. You know, we do know things, um, can sometimes be explained, but there's a lot of things that can't be explained. And I feel very confident that the stories that we have in a flashy beauty, paranormal Bigfoot are going to be extremely hard to explain. And I would love to hear some theories once this comes out. I'd love to hear what the audience thinks. I have a theory. Truth is stranger than fiction. Actually, that's a theory that that's not even a theory. That's just a statement. I'm that's making. a fact, I think. Yeah. I think that's a fact. I'm just, Truth is yeah, stranger just than had fiction. to throw that down. Oh my gosh. Portland is known for bad bumper <laughs> stickers and both of you have come up with bad bumper sticker slogans. It's so it's good. It's my side hustle. That's 
What I We're do walking with back counter. bumper stickers. <laughs> right. Yeah, you hang out on... with us long enough, Tobe, and it's just like... <laughs> Bordering one... on dad humor here. Yeah, it's just one thing after another. <laughs> oh. we were... Hey, um, you know, one of those, I, I don't want to say strange voices, but one of those fringe voices showed up out of the blue, and we can tease this, we've talked about them, and we did have a cancellation, and filling in out of nowhere um, with books in hand was... Uh, author of Dark Matter Monsters, Simeon Hine, and our guest here, Ron Moorhead and Simeon. If you could sit around a fire with those guys going back and forth, we get into it all uh, in this interview coming up. And Simeon is going to carry that mantle forward here in the future uh, for voices like Ron and ourselves. So um, I say we get into it and um, go check out... uh, Dark Matter Monsters here to learn more about what I'm saying. Check out Simeon Hines' interviews over on YouTube. He's got a website. And I think you will find it it complements the Ron Moorhead interview nicely. So let's get into it. Fasten your seatbelts. Truth is stranger than fiction. Here we go with Ron Moorhead. In the flesh is the legend Ron Moorhead. Hello, Ron. Hello, Tobe. How are you? We're good. Boy, oh boy. You saw the documentary. You saw Ron's footage. Uh, There's a lot of questions on my end, as always, about Ron's adventures up in the high Sierras. And that's kind of where a documentary leaves off is, uh, you know, Ron saying something very cryptic about quantum physics and uh, his stories and trying to get video and you know, falling short of the Patterson Gimlin shot, which we all do. But when it comes to audio, when it comes to language, you are the Patterson Gimlin of audio and Bigfoot language, Ron. I don't want to just put you on a pedestal that quickly when it comes to that, but really there's nobody else out there that has done what you've done. But really, there's no question. I guess it's a statement. Um, you know, well, thank I've, you, Toby. It, it's, a, it's an honor. And uh, it kind of humbles me for you to say that because I'm just doing what I what my passion tells me to do. And this is what I got to do in life. I'm uh, in my eighties now. And really, really, I just want to get what I think is right out there for other, maybe help other people. Well, you've had a chance to network with some important people along the way. And we have uh, Scott Nelson in the documentary as well, the Navy crypto linguist. And we haven't interviewed Scott fully yet. Uh, It'd probably be good to do back to back with you, if not with you on the line with him. Scott released back in 2010 time frame, I believe, what he calls the uh, Sasquatch phonetic alphabet in the little town of Eugene, Oregon, at the Oregon Sasquatch Symposium. And he was pretty certain that this phonetic alphabet pointed to the fact that you have, without a doubt, captured language. And I always thought pressured Scott and said, well, if there is language and Ron has captured a new language, isn't there culture? Doesn't, isn't it, isn't there implications of something greater than, you know, a hybrid primate happening here? And he said, oh my, yeah, but we haven't gotten there yet. Or have we Ron? Uh, not really. I mean, we've got to some ideas here, but, uh, until we really, can watch a family we don't know what's going on with them you know we don't know if they're here today and gone tomorrow if they're living in the rocks living on the ground or living in another the ether of a space we don't know they seem to be very elusive and uh, uh that's what i do is just look for these answers uh, mm. and uh, i think i've came across a few more since i wrote my last book the quantum bigfoot and uh i'm writing another book right now and uh Hope to get that out this year. I'm also doing an audio book on the Voices in the Wilderness, and uh, that should be out this year also. Got to keep getting something out, or you know, we're not going to be upright for the rest of our life. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but you know, a life uh, as we perceive it, uh, you know, you, you die and then you're buried. But life as we really are uh, cannot die. That's the uh, soul that we have, the consciousness that we have, the uh, that's all in the in ethereal world. And uh, that's the two parts of our embodiment. We have our physical body, which takes care of our functions and, and gets us through this environment. But we also have our, our etherical uh, part to us, which 
which cannot die according to quantum physics. Energy, which we are made of, you know, is frequency, energy, and vibration, and energy uh, vibrates at a frequency. And if you can, uh, Einstein, all these guys uh, went with that. Einstein said, if you can find the frequency of anything, you can change its matter. Well, that's pretty cool. You know, how do we find the frequency of something though? We're all a frequency, the most minute part of our body. And maybe I'm just rambling on here, but uh, uh, you, you may have already, I may have already said this previously to you, I don't know, but Ask me, ask me a question you want to, and I'll tell you I know or I don't think I know or I do. Well, know. here's the interesting part: is let's say you're, you know, Joe Blow or whoever, and you only know Ron from this documentary, this flesh and blood explanation documentary, right? I mean, we don't get into the weirder stuff, really. In part one, a flash of beauty, Bigfoot revealed, not fully revealed, but yet now they're hearing Ron Moorhead capture these incredibly weird sounds language and has stories more than anecdotal stories you have other people that have gone up there and witnessed what you've witnessed and experienced what you've experienced and here you are talking about frequency and vibrations it reminds me of another interesting fella that started nids the national institute of discovery science guy by the name robert bigelow people know him they know of his interest in what happened at Skinwalker Ranch. So here you guy, here you have a guy who's interested in UFOs tangentially and then really goes head over heels and then, you know, spends millions and if not billions of his own dollars privately. And now he's talking like you. He's talking about the afterlife. In fact, I think he just had a big uh, contest about, uh, you know, the afterlife or proof of the afterlife or something that effect and talking about frequency and vibration. So what that's interesting that you both are there. You're kind of both there at the same time. He started researching UFOs about the same time you did, a little bit later, perhaps. What do you think that is? Well, because they're out there, and uh, we're seeing them. They're visiting us. You're talking about UFOs and aliens? Well, I mean, but you're talking about... Um, you know, frequency, yeah. vibration, yeah, well, the spirit I, I, world, looking yeah. beyond the veil. Toby, I got into that because uh, something had to answer the anomalies happening at our camp up there. And Al Berry, who had a master's degree in science, said you have to stay with science. So I started getting into quantum physics because that is a science that really supersedes, it doesn't supersede, but rides on the back of our three-dimensional Newtonian physics that we've all been taught, which is everything is you know, frequency and vibration excuse me, material, physical, uh, measurable, predictable. And we're all uh, tuned into that because we're all taught that, but no one teaching quantum physics except the academias. And they, they, a lot of them, you know, unless you're training to be a physicist, you're not going to get into it. A lot of mysteries in that camp that uh, had to be answered. And, and so that's what I've been doing is trying to answer them with science. And um, I don't get into what they call a, well, the woo-woo, you know, I've been called a woo-wooer. <laughs> I'm just out of the box, and I, I don't stick with the three-dimensional three parameters that uh, that most academia stay with. And they have to stay within those parameters, or they will uh, get, uh, get kicked out of the club and lose respectability with their academic colleagues. Uh, I know these guys, and some of them believe in God, but how do you believe in God, whatever God is, and still stay within Everything has to be flesh and blood, and there's no such thing as other dimensions. Uh, no, there's there's more going on, and uh, a lot more going on, and I'm into it, and I, I'm satisfied with what I'm where I'm going. I believe I'm on the right trail. I'm just trying to say something in layman's terms that'll that'll help people, and that's all I'm for, really. Because otherwise, I'd I'd been gone a long time ago, the way I've lived. <laughs> I just, you know, I, I'm not a normal person, uh, Tob. <laughs> I've been all over the world. I flew my plane through canyons into Alaska, uh, way down in South America, and just I've done some pretty weird things. And I'm not saying that trying to boast or nothing, but um, I really have been on the edge a lot. And uh, with my airplane and the diving I've done, and just I didn't care because you don't want to want to wish you'd done something and then never done it. So I've tried to do everything I've wanted to do and figure out a way to do it. And uh, right now I'm kind of stuck because I'm uh, 
I'm not the man I used to be 20, 20 years ago. You know, I'm a little older. I guess that's good, but the only way I can figure that out, I got to be older because I got more to do, more to respond to. And that's what life's all about is, is doing, uh, responding to things. And if you respond to them properly, you will raise your personal vibrational frequency. And that's how we elevate ourselves. Because once we leave this embodiment, which we all will, you're going to go on to something else. Even Einstein wouldn't say that. Uh, physicists just say you change forms. And uh, religious people say you go to heaven. Well, you know, yeah, okay. Maybe you go to heaven. It depends on how you've been, I guess, they think. But to me, uh, you're going to have to either come back and, and re-embody re in something to learn your lesson. I think we have to learn our lesson. Whether you died at six years old or 106. If you didn't learn everything you got to learn, and that's by responding to everything with love and compassion, then you got to, you got to come back and learn that lesson. And I think we've been here multiple times and I didn't used to think that way. You know, I was raised religiously. So uh, that was a taboo to think about that because you can't see it, right? Well, most people think they can only believe in what they can see, but they got to learn to believe in what they can't see because there's energies all around us, all kinds of embodiments all around us. We can't see, and excuse me, they're not embodiments at all. They're, they're entities that are outside of our perception. Sometimes I wonder if Bigfoot can't get into that, you know, because there's something we we was up there around them so many times. You think we'd have seen them more often. We only got glimpses of them. But all this crazy stuff was happening too. You know, uh, sounds we couldn't identify, and I don't mean vocalizations. I mean weird sounds and and the lights that we couldn't explain. Uh, this stuff uh, and. You get into that, and you got to try to explain it, and that's what I do now. I get go off track back, pretty easy, though. So just go back uh, to this part where you said strange sounds. Let's start there, if you don't mind, Brett and Jill. I want to know what sort of other strange sounds you're talking about. Well, uh, once I was outside, and we were outside. There's six of us up there, five of us. Actually, the guy wouldn't go back anymore, and uh, I heard of what I thought was a, a sound like a huge huge tuning fork above our heads and i looked up in the sky trying to find the source of what it could be and couldn't find the source but it was there that was one thing and another time we i say this in my podcast quite a bit but i thought our camp was being tore apart we were inside our shelter and uh you know you think you're gonna look out there and see a big mess because we had all these barrels in to pack our food in and we had it all secured and all that stuff and we thought that stuff had been thrown around well you look out there later when all the commotion stopped, uh, there's nothing changed. Well, what do you do with that? You put it on the shelf because you can't explain it. And the lights, uh, Rob Berry wrote this about this in one of his articles or book. Uh, and uh, he said that uh, the Johnson brothers are claiming they had these balls of light that was actually following them around above their head. And they wouldn't be lying. These guys are a, a classy people. and. Uh, so I, I just uh, say that and many, many other things. Uh, I mean, I could talk about that stuff all night, but I really need to make a list, I guess. I mean, where all that stuff taken me is what I think is important. Not, not the Bigfoot scenario itself, but what, what it's all about. You know, because uh, you know, I just wrote another part of my book today. But if people get back into and I'm not a religious person, let's get that straight, but I am, I think there's some very great nuggets in these ancient texts, and I studied it all the way back into the cuneiform text, but you get into even the modern Bible, and, and it talks about the days of Noah, you know, as it was in the days of Noah, so it should also be in the second coming. Well, here we are, what it was like in the days of Noah, that's the first thing we'll look at. Well, what was happening? Aliens were coming down and giving advanced knowledge to humans and crossbreeding with the women. Giants were created. Today, aliens are here. There's a lot of reports of women being abducted and things happening. There's a lot of hybrids walking around on this planet, they say, and you'd never know the difference when you look at them. And uh, giants are here. So we got all three of those components. So I think we're living in a time when we ought to be aware of that and, and just be ready for it. And you get ready for that by to stop hurting other people, stop the warring, because what's really creating all this havoc is is the wars and the warring culture that we're in. Uh, we're a warring species. And that's too bad because that's not going to save this planet. We've got to try to save this planet. Someone goes and pushes the wrong button at one time and we start a nuclear war. That's going to destroy us all. 
and uh, should do our best to stop that stuff. But you got to change people's minds. Yeah, well, you've done that uh, in spades uh, throughout the years. I mean, you really changed your talk um, since I've known you. I think it was around 2012 when we met. And now you, um, you know, you're more esoteric. You're more thoughtful about the afterlife. You're you're bringing up things that are shocking to people that don't seem related to the Sierra sounds at all. But, you know, because it was so weird up there and I'd, if we have time, I want to get into some of these stranger stories here, but um, I'm going to take the mic uh, away from myself here and pass it off to Brett or Jill. Either one of you have a question for Ron. Yeah, you know, Ron, boy, you really get into so much um, that I really think involves everything, you know, the UFOs, uh, religious miracles, you know, the stuff that Jesus was doing in the Bible, the stuff that Jesus said that he said that, you know, everything that I can do, you can do as well. And we're seeing these things happen with um, eyewitness accounts and some of these Bigfoot experiences. We're hearing about these things happening with alien abductees. Um, some of these things transcend into ghost experiences. So it's all interconnected. Um, and I think that the, the quantum physics is really, you know, from what we've seen and from what we've talked to, I think that's it. I think that's, that's part of the, the recipe for this. You know, we get into it in our sequel, um, A Flash of Beauty, The Paranormal Bigfoot. And, you know, I, it, it almost feels like we're on the cusp of really gaining an incredible amount of knowledge as to how, you know, so many different things work, you know, whether it's afterlife, different dimensions, um, you know, you name it, you know, anti-gravity, so on and so forth. What, in your opinion, is um, is the most important of these things? I mean, what would you like to see humanity learn first and foremost? Peace in the world. <laughs> Isn't that what the uh, girls say when they win the title? Uh, let's see. Uh, I think humanity needs to understand how much more there is out there that they're not seeing or trying to understand. They're just out there living their daily life. And that's, that's okay, I guess, but it's not okay with me. I, I want humanity to uh, progress and elevate and, and change their frequency, get it higher. Cause that's what we're made to be. We're humans. We're very special. And I think that's what most people underestimate. They think we're just another entity on a million planets. that's probably got species and, Probably more than a million is probably innumerable amount of planets that have species on it. And some may be three-dimensional like us, but some may be higher dimensional. There's a lot of AI stuff going on right now. And I think uh, people need to look into that because that's going to take over our culture if it isn't handled properly. And I don't know that we can handle it properly because they are already gaining their own consciousness, their own <laughs> ability to figure things out. And they teach each other uh, through the cloud. You know, every, all of them's connected. And uh, once one knows one thing, they all know it. And it's just uh, can be spooky. And they can look just like us. But do they have a soul? Do they have a spirit? Do they have a consciousness really like we do? Were they made in the image of God like we were? You know, we are special because we are able to experience things and respond to things properly. And just like Jesus said, you brought up his name long ago, uh, we can do what he did and he says love everybody somebody hit you slap just turn the other cheek and it's it's amazing uh how open this plus as we get older like like you mentioned uh what's his name a billionaire a while ago bigelow yeah uh he's probably older too like i am and when you get older like that you, you gain a little maybe knowledge or something uh we hope anyway when you're green you grow when you're ripe you rot that's my saying go like that uh, now, uh yeah. you know things you open your mind up and uh it's unlimited and i relate it to a parachute you know if it doesn't open it doesn't work and uh you just got to open it up and realize what we really are we're very special and if an ai ever or if we ever become ais which i'm hearing they can transfer their consciousness into a body and if they can do stuff like 
that, uh, or if they get to be doing that, which who knows, but I think they do, uh, uh, they won't be able to reach the frequency that we are capable of reaching. We we're made the image of a very high frequency entity. And uh, we got to understand that. And if we, if we take the, uh, well, the aliens are going to offer us something. They're going to offer us good bodies, ones that don't get sick, ones that don't grow old, all that stuff. Do we want to take that? Who wouldn't take that? I mean, I'd love to have a body of my 25 years <laughs> when I was 25 years old. I'll tell you what. <laughs> but if you do, you won't be able to elevate your consciousness because you won't be the entity that you're made to be. So I, I want to warn everybody, and this is probably what I would say to the world, is, is don't do it. When you're offered that, just die normally and you'll be better off. Uh-huh. But it's going to be hard for a lot of people when they say, uh, well, I'll give you a new leg, I'll give you two new arms, I'll give you everything you need, and so you won't get sick anymore and you can live forever or live for a thousand years, whatever. Hire a lot of people are going to say okay to that, and they they will be restricting themselves to a three dimensional. Ron, when it comes to some of the more salacious claims, one of those is that these beings, these people, Sasquatch can heal. Now you just described a perfect scenario where that could be done to a witness, a long term extended witness like yourself. So, is that a something that? ever has happened up at the Sierra camp on any level, or maybe the opposite, it was anybody made sick or injured, and B, what do you think of those claims? Well, in my mind, uh, anything is possible. Uh, I don't think all Bigfoots are the same. They're not of the same genome. Uh, the same alien species didn't make all of them, and uh, I think different aliens have been here. Quite sure of that, and they have uh, messed with the genome of different ones and made them what they wanted them to be so what the agenda is it depends on who made them uh, some of them probably have the capability of doing just what we talked about if they can enter your mind and get on the frequency you're on they can mind speak to you they can heal you if 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 you if they're that, if they're that way um, advanced intelligence uh, ai uh, they'll be able to do that and they can tell you what's wrong with you i'm sure and you may want to just go ahead and heal you, but that's not going to change who you are uh, unless your whole body is different. You know, like if, you, if your consciousness is transferred into an AI body, which is indestructible, pretty much indestructible. Ron, um, have you seen, um, just, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, th- just while you're thinking about it, have you ever seen the Steven Spielberg movie AI? No, I guess I should. Yes, you should. Um, and I hate to, I hate to, to, spoil it but it's such (laughs) an important movie right now it came out 22 years ago and it's amazing how far ahead of its time it was the very ending of the film these beings show up and the audience at the time in 2001 thought they were aliens and they weren't they these beings were actually ai beings humanity had long since died in the film and the only thing that was left on planet earth were ai beings that essentially created themselves Uh and they they find a human species uh one last human that they're able to bring back to life for a single day in order to study it to see what humanity was all about so i just want to really recommend you know you first and foremost to take a look at that because i think you would find it fascinating and eerie all the same and i would say the same thing to the viewers to take a look at that in regards to the ai because the 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 point of that movie is that you you can't replace the human spirit you can't replace the human soul it's never going to be replaced and um and i think that's just that's the important point here and i think that's the point that you're making is that regardless of whether that spirit is inside of the the body case i guess if you or the skin suit if you want to call it that or if it's in the ether, uh, we are all unique individuals. And I think that um, we need to understand that, uh, you know, when we do die, our afterlife here on earth is the legacy that we leave behind. 
you know, so not to get too deep here on this show about Bigfoot, but <laughs> you're going to make me cry, wanted, Brett. Jeez. I just wanted to <laughs> accentuate your point. Pause here, and take an offering. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. I interrupted this time. Jill, did you have a question? I, I do. Um, my, my question isn't as philosophical as what you guys have been talking about, but I want to get back to uh, the Sierra sounds and talking about the samurai chatter. Now, I have to imagine that before you were able to record those and make them public and let people know about what you what you and the rest of the hunting party were experiencing, I have to imagine other people were hearing this out in the woods, out when they were they were in isolated areas. Were there did reports of the the samurai like chatter become more uh, more pronounced? I guess after you were able to share your recordings. A lot of reports came in saying we've heard sounds very much like that. Uh, of course, people aren't out there normally with recorders. So, yeah, I, I've had a lot of people say, I've heard the samurai chatter. I've heard sounds that sound just like your recordings, and there's nobody around us. So, that was way back in the 70s, you know, early. And uh, that was the night I saw one, by the way, when I reported the samurai. Uh, he was up behind me, and it was, uh, we think, an adolescent and a female down the creek, and, and he comes streaking by very fast <laughs> and uh, very fast and uh, very smooth that was my only real like i say real good seeing one which you hear them but it got me into thinking too how come we didn't see them more often because as close as we were to them and as much as we tried we very rarely get even a glimpse and a lot of times we couldn't get that you know we'd, we'd jump out there and there had to be one right there but well, that's another thing that happened one time. Warren and I, uh, Johnson, he and I stepped out of the shelter, thinking we're going to see this one run away because he's right behind this big tree chattering. And um, we started walking up to that tree and we both just got froze. And I mean, just froze. Now, it could have been infrasound, you know, that does affect you. Uh, and that's what was suggested because there has to be a reason for that. But we could not move forward and we weren't afraid. It wasn't like we were scared because that time we. We felt pretty secure that these things weren't trying to eat us or something, so we were okay with that. And uh, we both could walk back, but we couldn't go forward. And uh, we no sooner got back in the shelter when this thing started mouthing off again, and like it was laughing at us or something. And, you know, they they got these things they can do that we're trying to understand, and a lot of it's related to a lot of things that we just need to understand, and it's just that way. And I think the, the key to a lot of it is quantum physics to understand what our limitations are as humans. You know, we only see within 430 to 770 terahertz. That's our light's frequency. We only see with light. That's the light's frequency. But all these other frequencies are out there. And uh, get into how they can disappear. Well, I got to tell you this one. This is fun because this is the most exciting thing. I, Dr. Paul Dirac uh, from, uh, I think he was from the UK, but he retired in Florida actually. He got the Nobel Prize in 1933 for antimatter. Now, this will sound like nothing to do with Bigfoot, but it does. So listen to carefully, buddy. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> antimatter, as you know what it is, it's not matter. It's antimatter. So it's it's direct exchange. And as you it's direct exchange from matter to energy, energy to matter. They are interchangeable. Man, how much cleaner can it be? They can change their matter into energy. They would disappear. <laughs> out of our frequency their track waves would stop because their density would stop you hear that all the time or the track waves just stop well then everybody thinks they got hit uh, picked up by a helicopter well no the density goes away when they disappear or when they change into energy because a lot of people say this all big would turn into a ball of light well can that happen this ball of this huge thing of light that we see and go by us up there in 2016 was just floating by and I mean it didn't like it wasn't like a bolt of lightning but it was about three or four foot long and just glowed and just floated by our tent and I don't know what do you do with that you know I mean you don't know what its intentions are you don't know what it's doing it's like it didn't even care about us it just kept going and just went on down the ravine and uh, the stuff like that happens and uh, the answer to it I think is just 
people have to realize that everything is energy, everything. And if you can find the frequency of that energy, you can change its matter. And I'm wondering if Bigfoot can't, hasn't been given the attribute of the vocal mechanism, which is very expansive, of uh, changing his uh, vocal tone to his frequency and changing it into energy. I don't know. Just don't know that part. But I know we should have seen them more often up there. And uh, there you go. But Einstein said the same thing. You know, if you can find the frequency of anything, you can change its matter. Matter and energy are interchangeable. Well, you put that together with CERN in 2012, <laughs> Hydron Collider, they proved that in 2012 when, when they, that particle turned into energy. And wow, I just, that's established. So these people say they saw one disappear. They don't belong on the funny farm. You know, going off of what you're talking about, it reminds me of, and we, we talked religion earlier, so I'm going to talk it again. It reminds me of um, this documentary uh, about the Shroud of Turin and a scientist, a computer uh, scientist, graphic artist, Ray Downing, was trying to debunk the Shroud of Turin. Instead, he found out that the Shroud of Turin seemed to be a negative print only for this generation to discover through 3D imaging. And here we are again, talking about physical matter, possibly turning to light or turning to something shifting, in this case, Christ of Nazareth, shifting his vibrational state to transfer through fabric. Um, if that's true, which I don't think the shroud has ever been debunked, um, you know, there's religious implications to being able to doing, uh, doing something like this. Uh, you've been all over the world You've been to Tibet. This is where the monks say they can do stuff like this. In fact, we just wow. talked to uh, Simeon Hine, who claimed that uh, it was in part two of the documentary Paranormal Bigfoot. And he was saying that he had somebody levitate a cigarette across a room and land in his pocket. Um, this sounds like it's within our reach. Have you met anybody that has these capabilities besides Bigfoot? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't met Bigfoot yet, but uh, no, I haven't. But I'm writing actually one of my chapters about the monks over there, how they levitate and through sound vibration or finding the vibration of something. And uh, there's stories about that. It's all getting hidden, though, but there's a lot of paperwork that you can dig it out and uh, how they do that stuff, how they levitate themselves. And uh, it's through vibration. And uh, But no, I have not met any of them. But I, I, I know the history of some of that stuff I've been reading. About like Yuri Gellert. Have you ever sat down with Yuri? Uh, any of these remote viewers? Uh, they have extraordinary claims and abilities. <clears throat> remote viewing, yeah, I've, I've heard. People. We all can do that. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of opening up your pineal gland and relaxing your head and, and uh, seeing what's coming to it. Close your eyes, too, so you can see. <laughs> you got to right. see through your third eye. And... Uh, I believe there's also another element to, you know, they say your heart and your brain has to be in coherence. Well, I think there's another element that I think if we open our pineal gland, decalcify and get it so it's receiving things, just receiving things, it connects into the heart's brain. The heart will be in coherence with the upper brain, upper head, and tell you which way to go, what to do, the gut feeling that we get. Well, but our analytical brain, because it's been taught all these things throughout these eons of time uh, in this three-dimensional world, uh, it'll I will override that sometimes. So it's important to just go by your feelings and how you feel about certain things. Brett, so I, Jill. I haven't met a lot of these special people, but uh, <clears throat> I don't have anything against any of it. They may interrupt you here. I can't see uh, Brett, so I just have to ask him periodically. Any questions there, Brett? I'm, I'm actually in the ether on this episode. <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> just... <laughs> Just so you know that, and my camera's not working today. Um, there is so much here, you know, to, to really wrap our heads around. Um, and, you know, there's a lifetime um, of knowledge here. Um, I had a point, it completely slipped out of my head, and it's out floating in space right now. Um, that's all right. I can catch up here while you're thinking of it. Yeah. I want to ask Ron about the missing tapes because maybe people don't know that there's audio that was caught up in a house fire. There's audio that belonged to other people that were at this camp. Um, 
talk about that, Ron. Ex you know, let people well, know had, about this tapes, missing audio. Uh, yeah, a lot of my tapes were burned. My house fire, um, 1970 something, middle of 70s, and uh, I had some primo sounds. <laughs> I had stereo mics, the best uh, cassette recorder you could buy in the time, Sony. Uh, they're still battery operated from D cell batteries, and I fixed up a remote switch so you wouldn't hear it with mercury switch i put one stereo speaker a sm58 one on this side one on that side of the shelter and uh man i could hear this thing walking around the shelter two-legged elephant you could hear it sounds so clear and i had all these tapes and they burn up in my house fire and uh i think it was 1976 when that happened but i had sent one off to alan berry and a copy of it and that's what i made my second cd uh and then i got bills who was also recording and uh, i got his uh, copied so I, I could use some of that uh for my second cd that i produced to tell my story and uh it's it's that's one of the lost tapes the other ones aren't necessarily lost uh, the Johnsons, uh, somewhere in their archives, they've probably got them stuffed down somewhere. But Warren Johnson, who's been passed away now for quite a while, uh, I think he gave them to one of his sons. And I think I know which one, but I don't know him. And, uh, Larry Johnson, who was just with us till the last year, I think he's passed away now. And these guys are all dying on me here, you know. Uh, Al Berry passed away in 2012. And... Uh, uh, Anyway, I got a, I've got all his tapes, and uh, I say tapes. I've transferred them all into uh, into hard drives, so I've got them on my program here. But uh, uh, we all had redundancy in a lot of our tapes, but I had some really, really crisp, good sounds of the ones that got burned, and that's too bad. Well, let's fast forward to like the mid '80s and the '90s after these sounds are recorded and you've publicized them your your earliest work um which was i believe a, 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 a not a dvd but a cd um and even before that probably did you do these on tape and record yes tape you did and, no tape and a yeah. cd i did okay. on, my, on my first uh big good sounds that was on cassette tape and uh and the cd no oh. Is that tape yeah. yeah but nothing on lp no. there's no like 45 of ron well there Moorhead. was alberry uh, had one on 45 and oh that's cool one of those. that's a real i got one it's a real collector's item yeah and, uh, you gotta find a player nowadays and play right. those things right <laughs> uh yeah that's the issue it's trying to find a player and uh, with a good needle because you don't want to screw something like that up and uh but that's part of my collection i've got um, but now you the, mentioned the Johnson brothers, where is, where's this audio, when's this audio coming out? Cause I know you've been waiting, uh, you know, I don't know what the relationship is, but if there's audio like yours that has not come out yet, um, will that day ever come? I doubt it just because, uh, I don't know the Johnson boy that's got it. One of his sons, he lives somewhere in California and, uh, He's, uh, he don't know me either. Uh, and uh, truthfully, Warren Johnson and I had a little enmity between us at the last, and he was, uh, brought that to his children. I don't think they want me to do what I've done with this. You know, they don't think I should come out with it like this because there's there's uh, more to these things. I think uh, Warren, has, Warren and Lewis both have seen them in the camp and these beings and they think they should be left alone and don't mess with them they're they're beyond us and that's probably true but the human psyche won't let that happen we got to reach the bottom of some of this stuff that's what i do and that me coming out with this these recordings is really uh through a loop into that relationship that we might have had and uh because uh it was their camp to start with in 1958, and I didn't get into it to 1971, but really the stuff didn't start happening until 71 that we know of. You know, maybe things happened, but they never thought it was, never thought Bigfoot, it wasn't on their radar. Uh, so uh, I have a, a, a lot more sounds 
but the best of them uh, you can hear already. And uh, so uh, I don't know if anyone later wants to study or somebody is qualified to study the rest of them to see if there's any any way they can interpret what these things are saying. I don't know if that can be done or not. Until, like like Scott Nelson says, until one comes up and says, Uga Uga, that's a tree and points to a tree. You don't know that Uga Uga means a tree. So that's where we'll go with it. And <clears throat> Al was very fortunate that night. He caught those real clear sounds up the up behind the shelter about 40 feet. His, his mic was remoted. And uh, he, had, he got within sight of that mic, but he never could see anything. And it was not dark, dark. You know, even the starlight's up at 8,400 feet elevation. It's bright. And uh, I shouldn't say bright, but it's not like full moon. It's just, it's just you can see. And uh, he he didn't see anything, and yet he hear it. He could hear it. Now Jeff Meldrum mentioned to me one time maybe they got air sacs. Well, that's another story too because uh, maybe they do, and they can throw their sounds like a like a holler monkey. Uh, these uh, this lady from the UK who had that sighting in California witnessed these uh, these Bigfoots who on the beach, and she uh, watched the male, you know throwing uh, seaweed out of the ocean into the two females on the, on the shore and they were doing something to it and uh, he didn't know what she didn't know what uh, but she she was not about to panic she didn't know what to think of this she's I gotta get a picture of this and she pulled the lens cover she was waiting on the sun to go down and she pulled the lens cover off her camera and dropped it on the rocks and this male heard her and started screaming and coming back towards her the female stopped him and she felt like she would have died right then if, if they had stopped him. But uh, she somehow ended back at her car. She figured she was drugged back because she fainted at that point. And uh, I talked to her personally and got her. And she's a linguist, a very educated lady. And she's fluent in seven different languages. And it just, you know, she told me, then back to air sacs, she said when the male screamed at her, his, his throat swelled out. And uh, that was pretty cool. She drew a picture for me and sent it to me, too. Yeah. Uh, anyway, there you go with the whatever. <laughs> I get lost in the stuff. <laughs> so yeah, I, it's fun, though. It's fun. You know, you got to have fun with it. And actually, good feelings and good, good everything about you will bring up your elevation, bring up your frequency, and you're better off. <clears throat> question for you, Ron, kind of changing the subject here. Um, a lot of people ask, and you don't have to, we don't want to give up the location of the Sierra camp, but a lot of people have asked kind of in a general area where the Sierra camp was, you know, cause the Sierra is obviously a massive mountain chain. Um, so that's the first question. And the second question is what was the prevailing theory among the men that were up there as to what they were talking about? Was there ever a prevailing theory? Well, the theory was they're just some kind of a, lost something that hadn't been identified by science like an ape out there I mean, just like most hunters or people are looking for now uh that's the answer to your second question the first question is uh what was your first question <laughs> yeah, memory just not as long as it used to be <laughs> no the first question is um where in what was the kind of the general area in which the sierra oh came? that's so question. people can yeah, i get asked that a lot of, form an idea as to to what location well, between uh, between yosemite and lake tahoe that's a lot of space <laughs> it sure is <laughs> okay but that's what i tell people because there's a vast area there you're right but you know 15 miles away from us i was a crow flies i interviewed a, a forestry worker who had witnessed a bigfoot and uh, he also witnessed at the same time a ufo hovering over this mountain which i know where it's at and he watched this daytime for 30 minutes, he said, and uh, wow, that's pretty incredible. Uh, I also, that's another thing that I saw up there personally at our camp was a, a UFO of some type coming down from the sky, a big blue ball coming down, and I lost it behind the trees, and that's all I can say about that. I don't know what was going on, but it was happening at the same time this Bigfoot stuff was happening, so I do believe there's a connection between them. Uh, I don't know that, I don't know exactly what other than they may have been the creators you know of, of this species and uh again we don't know the agenda so i have a question ron you've traveled the world you've been there you've done that outside of your experiences at the sierra camp 
What has been the most amazing thing that you've witnessed or experienced? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think my big eye opener was down in uh, South America, really, with Brian Forrester. And uh, been down there a couple times, two different years, with two different scientists, and then studying the elongated skulls and going up to the high country where the enigmatic structures are. And those elongated skulls, I went down there to see if it had anything to do with the sedge of crest that's sometimes uh, mentioned on Bigfoot up here. And sure enough, there's a story from the Inca, stories from the Incas <clears throat> saying, this is pre-Inca people, by the way, but the stories from the Incas saying they warred with <clears throat> with uh, the uh, Aztec and the Mayan in Central America. And you got stories of them warring with, with giants in North America. And that takes us into the Lovelock Caves. When I've been there four times, uh, trying to get information, but they've got it all taken away. You know, you can't have access to any of that stuff they found in 1911. Between 1911 and 1928, that's how long it had been open and available for anyone to just to scavenge it. But what was left there and what was taken to a museum had been taken away. So they say, no, there's no Bigfoot. They're just robust people. <laughs> we had to get the Paiutes, which have a, have, well, Sarah Winnemucca wrote a book on the Paiutes and uh, Life of the Paiutes. And she has supposedly a dress made of the hair of one of the red-haired giants, eight-foot cannibalistic giants. That's why they drove them into the cave and shot them as they came out from the smoke. And I've been in the cave. There's a real sticky substance on the ceilings, which you can't reach, but it's uh, something. I don't know. But there's a lot more to be found in that cave if they just let us let us go into it. Uh, they've got a lot of it blocked off in the back, back areas with... Anyway, uh, that took us into North America, the, the Paiute saying they warred with giant, catabolistic giants. And, the, and you got the Minaret Skull, which was found by Dr. Denton over in the Minarets of the Sierra Nevada Mountains. And I've been in there a once or maybe twice. Uh, we rode in horseback and started staying there a few days trying to dig around where he found this giant skull. And he sent it off to uh, UCLA, and that's where it lost. No, 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 it just stops. You can't find a trace of it. Alberry Chase sat down to his blue in the face. He couldn't find it uh, because UCLA, somebody's using it for an ashtray or, or Smithsonian ticket away. We don't know. Uh, but anyway, uh, then you've got the minaret, uh, Martindale mummies, which were found in uh, Yosemite, actually, in uh, 1898, I think it was. And uh, I chased that down until, uh, let's see, uh, Ripley's, believe it or not, bought them. And uh, there's stuff happening in uh, this. There's a lot of history of giants in North America. I spoke with Jim Vieira years ago in Georgia, and uh, he had a whole list, a book almost, of papers and uh, that he dug up about giants and pictures of giants being here in North America. <clears throat> and now they're acknowledging, now there's, there's some very large people around, you know, eight foot things happening here. But what is a giant? You know, if everybody's eight foot and you're, you're not, then maybe they think you're a midget. <laughs> you know, I mean, and if if you're eight foot and something, the whole group of people that's twenty foot, well, you're the you're the midget. You know, so it's all relative. And uh, Bigfoot, whatever they are, at least the ones we encountered are huge. And we found a track up there one time in our uh, area, not our camp, but outside of our camp. It was twenty five and a half inches long, and that. You'd have to do the math on that, but the 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 tracks we found tracks were thirteen feet apart. Now that's a that's a big something, and uh, it wasn't running. It didn't appear to be running. I mean, at least the tracks didn't show skid marks or nothing. And I got pictures of that. If I hadn't seen that myself, I know that I, and I didn't talk about that for a long time just because it's too hard to believe. People people can believe there might be an eight foot tall Bigfoot out there, but you tell them it was a twelve fifteen foot tall. Bigfoot out there, like, nah, nah. <laughs> well, how do those things stay so hidden? You know, you got the uh, Portlock event that I went to a couple of years ago. They took me up to the Discovery Channel, did, and you know they have something up there. I do believe uh, they could claim it was like 15 feet tall, and it was tearing the villages apart in the late 40s and killing, I think, close to 30 of them before they just abandoned the village because. But then when I flew over going in there in a helicopter, uh, you could see where years ago they had uh, really over-timbered it, just really stripped it. But the new growth had already brought some trees up. Uh, and I know there were, I've seen some pictures of the fish they were taking out there, and there was just 
grossers. There was really a lot of fish, and they were also mining the area. And you know, if you're mining, uh, that's another thing too. That you know, I think they were intruding on Bigfoot's territory. And I guarantee, you, if one of them had walked out of the woods while we was up there, this guy with a big gun, I'm pretty sure would have protected us. <laughs> But again, um, if you're if you're hurting their, their territory and damaging, you know, there's something about trees too going on in this Bigfoot world. I got a whole chapter on that in my new book too. How can I? I'm rambling. <laughs> okay. Hey, in the uh, in the few minutes that we have left with you, Ron. Um, oh, that time it, already. I know, right? Okay. Someone's got to eat around here. But when it comes to the future. And moving forward here, you know, I when I started doing conferences back in 2009, 2008 time frame, it was solely a flesh and blood conversation. It was solely, these are Bigfoot conversations, and these are the people on the fringes that will come to your conference, and you may suffer attendance-wise because you're inviting them. Please have the flesh and blood people only. But now, these conferences are on the fringes. You don't have a Bigfoot conversation without having a Linda Moulton Howe or a Simeon Hine or someone like you show up because people want to hear it. And I believe that they want to hear the truth. My question to you is, how do we get to the truth? Since I feel like we're knocking on truth's door right now and there's still some hurdles here, um, you know, give us some advice here. Um, how do you, you know, walk calmly and carry a big stick and still deliver the truth? Well, that's what we're doing right now with stuff like this and i think <clears throat> with the with the films coming out and different things people are being inundated more and more to the uh, possible paranormal uh woo -woo factor but really that's the laws behind that is quantum physics and i think if they educate themselves and i think that's what the 2012 mind calendar is about i mentioned this too i think that was a time of enlightenment we're in a time of everybody's being enlightened and are learning more and more and more and the more we get out and talk about it like I do and like you do, and uh, the more people will understand how much more there is and how much how important it is to react to things properly and and be a good human. And uh, I know I'm speaking at several conferences uh, this, this year and already booked me in the next year. I'm still upright. Uh, never know, you know. <laughs> Just saying. But how you move forward? By doing what we're doing, just keep pounding at the door and paying attention. Don't don't discard anybody or anything, and unless you go at their house and they got a hundred thousand candles lit and you know beads all over the place or something. Yeah, good advice. <laughs> I've Jill, been there those places. <laughs> I know you have, Jill Brett. Any uh, final questions here? No, I just want to say thank you to Ron for everything that he's done and is doing and continue to do to, to really push this forward. I think that uh, it's obvious that there's something more than just the flesh and blood here. And I, I think Ron's voice is so instrumental and important in, in pushing that forward. So thanks again for all of your hard work and tenacity, Ron, and, and all of your research. Thank you. But one thing about flesh and blood nothing is flesh and blood only we all have a consciousness there's an answer to all the ways we can do different things remote viewing one of them I mentioned that earlier uh telekinesis telepathy all those things we have within us but it's not with our body it's with our etherical part and that's what doesn't die so we need to uh, uh evolve into that and learn how to work work with it more and better and and uh i think that's important Nothing is just flesh and blood only. And that's what I say to people. Nothing. We're not flesh and blood only. If we were, we'd just die and that'd be it. And goodbye. We're all atheists. So not well really. said. Well, Ron, I I am just so... I could just listen to your stories all day. But I mean, I don't know if our... Yeah, I think our audience would hang out for a few more hours. But you're, you're a few hours ahead of us. And I know you've got stuff to do. But I am just so... It's been such an honor just, you know, ever since... Uh, getting into the Bigfoot community back in 2012, you you were one of the first people I met at Beachfoot. Oh. And so, 
it's just been so great hearing your stories. Um, and I, I can't wait to see what the future holds. <laughs> well, thank you, Jill. And thank you, Toby, for putting this uh, together like this. You're, you're, you're a good uh, part of this team, I think. And uh, you got a good voice on the mic. And uh, I'd like to know what kind you're using. I bought a new one. Everything about <laughs> it here. But for my for my uh oh that's per that's a joe rogan special right there holy cow my, uh that's from my uh <clears throat> vocal my <throat> audiobook yeah that's what i'm doing oh yeah yeah you gotta be uh just the right uh microphone for that well and, as, uh, uh, anyway, well, i'd like to see you when we come out there we're about there at the end of august uh, okay yeah but i think we'll you got, uh, you be got a place tied down and swim yet not yet, but we're working on it. We got some clever options. All right. How do you do that? Right? Yeah. Do <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, Ron Moorhead. And uh, thank you again, Ron. Thank you. Take care. This has been a Resonance Production podcast. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions, you can email us at bigfootrevealedpod at gmail.com. Also, if you're just discovering the Flash of Beauty universe, you can watch our documentary on most major streaming platforms.